back on the Zero Hour, where I'm your host, Richard R.J. Escal. And as always, I look forward to my conversations with my next guest. Richard Wolf is an economist, economic historian, author of a number of books, host of Economic Update on Free Speech TV, professor at a bunch of places, and I'm sure he's got some other credentials as well I'm leaving out. Uh, but we thought we'd have a different kind of conversation with you today, so I'm looking forward to it. First of all, Richard Wolf, welcome back to the Zero Hour. Thank you very much, RJ. I'm very glad to be here. You know, there's this saying, this it become a cliche, which I've paraphrased as follows. Uh, those who do not understand history are doomed to repeat Santayana's comment about those who do not history, do not understand history being doomed to repeat it. You hear it all the time, but we never stop to think about, uh, you know, so much of what we do in the political world, in the economic world, in the journalistic world, uh, as we make decisions about the human future, the human present, is rooted in our what we think is our understanding of history. But we, we very rarely take the time to think about, can it be understood as a singular thing? How does one understand it? How does one understand different or reconcile different interpretations of history? So this seemed like a good time, particularly in light of uh, all sorts of world events that, uh, you know, are each asserting their own claims on our understanding of history to talk about the ways in which we understand history and how that affects us. First of all, does that uh, introduction make sense to you? Absolutely. And I could not think of a more urgent topic in the past, in the present, and no doubt for quite a while into the future. You know, there are many ways of putting it. One way is to say, look, we have different understandings, different ways of grasping the reality around us, depending on where we're standing in relationship to whatever it is we're trying to understand. So, for example, nobody would be surprised to learn that large numbers of people in the Ukraine area have a different notion or understanding of that war than significant numbers of people in Russia do, or in Palestine and Israel, or in the United States and China, or, and I could, you know, the examples are, are enormous. Now, we could try, and there are some of us who do, to push and punch our way through that situation by insisting that there is a right way and a wrong way to understand it. But my view is that that is a difficult and dangerous dogmatism to uphold. I know it frightens people to think that there are different perspectives and no way to determine which is the truth of the matter. Maybe we are, as a people, left with different viewpoints, different perspectives, different theories, different knowledges, different sciences about how the world works. Now, what, let me give you a, a bit of an argument for this. Number one, there are areas where human beings have agreed, at least in large numbers, to accept the idea that there are irreducibly different ways to understand something, and we need to live with that rather than try to resolve which is the right one and which is the wrong one. For example, religion. Mm. Many, many people in the United States are comfortable with the idea that the Baha'i religion, Lutheranism, Roman Catholicism, Judaism, Islam, and so forth, I don't mean to leave anybody out, 
are different ways of understanding what you might call the human condition or the relationship between human beings and deities, one or more of them, et cetera, et cetera. And we claim to believe, most of us, in toleration. That is, these are irreducibly different. And we would look with some apprehension at a person, and we have them amongst us, who say, no, 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 and then articulate one of them is the right thing. One of them has got it right, who and what and how God is and works, and all the rest of them are evil or ignorant or some mixture of both. Right? So we've accepted to live in a world where we have irreducibly different religious notions or beliefs and we are not about to go and have big arguments about which is the right one and which is the wrong one. So that if a person asked us, what's the right religion? We would say, I'm not going to answer that question because the question makes no sense to me. Let me give you another example where we do that. Suppose I ask you the question, what color is Thursday? You're not going to sit there and rack your brain to give me the right answer because you don't think there is a right answer. And the reason you don't is that in your mind, you don't see, and no one has ever es especially worked on you to see a one-to-one -one correspondence between days of the week and colors of the spectrum. Now, you could have learned that. Suppose in your elementary school, your beloved kindergarten teacher or first grade teacher had taught you a wonderful little children's rhyme. Monday is pink and Tuesday is green. And, and you repeated it and you enjoyed it and you uh, clasped hands with one another and went around in a dance, all of which you loved. If you were such a person and the teacher 20 years later said, okay, students here in my college class, what color is Thursday? Up would go your hand because you knew, you knew it was Thursday. You knew it was purple or whatever it was because you had been, but if we take a step back, we understand you don't know that it's that color because it is that color for you and for everybody else. It is an absolute truth. You don't believe it. You think that truth is relative to how you were raised. And if you were raised like most of us, that days of the week have no particular color, then for you, the answer is to the question, that's not a question that makes any sense. Here's another one. Which is heavier? The number six? Or the number 18, you again would say to me, that question makes no sense. Therefore, I'm not going to answer it. And I'm certainly not going to allow someone to tell me that there is an answer and that this is the right one. Last example, and I'll stop. Suppose I ask you, which is the right way to eat? Knife and fork, chopsticks, your hands. Again, if you're the normal, intelligent person, you would explain to me, a little bit like an adult to a child, that this is a stupid question, by which you would mean that that's not the right way to think about alternative ways of eating. Eating is important. How we do it affects our aesthetics, our clothing, our conviviality with one another. But to ask which is the right way to eat is a question that you refuse. Okay, why not do the same thing? As, by the way, great philosophers have done since the ancient Greeks. Why don't we stop with this idea, the right way, the truth, as in the singular truth with a capital T and the word absolute in front of it? and recognize that truths exist inside theories. In the theory of the little child who learned 
uh, about the days of the week and what color they were in that that person's theory of the week color was relevant there was a truth within that framework namely that thursday is purple but for other people with a different framework that wasn't the truth there was no truth etc i believe that we would be much less likely to kill each other to go to war against each other to destroy one another if we stopped imagining that there is a singular truth worrying ourselves sick that we don't have it fighting against people who claim they have it and we don't and trying to impose our particular one on them if we rather explored the different ways we made sense of the world of the past the present and the future we would have a much better way of inter acting with one another than if we attacked each other for failure to grasp the truth as if it were singular let's take one of those areas you use not so much to not to pick on it particularly but as an example of where <clears throat> this can work or break down and that's religion uh you described quite well a view of religion <clears throat> excuse me that persisted in this country for example i would say for certainly for let's say for decades after the second world war there was an increasing sense of religious tolerance there's always been intolerance among groups and so on uh my mother was for example was a, a devout atheist to such a thing she was a very a, a committed atheist for uh but she also you know she converted to judaism as an act of solidarity after the holocaust she and to marry my father uh she was a great believer in ecumenism as they called it then you know the tolerance of religions as you described it <clears throat> and uh stephen jay gould the, the biologist and science writer famously referred to religion and uh politics or other spheres of human activity his phrase was as non-overlapping magisteria right that you could particularly science that you could embrace religious beliefs over here and embrace scientific and other beliefs perhaps belief about history how history works how economics works how cultures work over here and they were non overlapping therefore not in conflict but it could be argued that that concept has broken down over the past few decades right on both sides uh, you have uh many religionists some of whom have acquired increasing political and other power insisting that no religion can dictate how we view evolution how we teach evolution how we teach other sciences how we practice medicine and so on and then you have in some cases uh atheists popular atheist writers who embrace uh a very neoliberal uh view of the world and uh with a zeal for example sam harris calling for the nuclear bombing of 10 muslim capitals which he did in writing uh to bring the world peace so and obviously i'm not tiring atheists with that approach or all religionists with the extreme approach but it seems to me that inherent in what you're describing is the need to recognize uh these separate centers of gravity in human experience and keep them distinct or the entire uh project you're describing breaks down is that is that fair you think well i don't know rj maybe we disagree L let me respond the way i read the very things you described and you described perfectly reasonably and and eloquently is a little bit different i think for a long time human beings lived in a culture which they created in which you are to look for the truth that there is a singular truth out there that we can know how the world really works and that there's a bunch of us 
trying to figure it out, and we're getting closer, and, and some of us are closer than others to capturing how it is. I think that's deeply ingrained in us, very deeply. So that for me, the way I read your story is, okay, some of us recognize that there are areas of life which somehow don't fit that story. So we are tolerant of different religions, different conceptions of God, different etc. But there are others, because they're desperate to hold on, where no, 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 that search for the truth is legitimate, is appropriate. <laughs> Let me take the position, which is mine, but that may surprise some of you. It used to be called the debate between relativist or relative notions of truth and absolute. There are people who think that truths are parts of the theories in which they arrive, that different theories elaborate and establish their own standards of what counts as true and what counts as false. That's clear to me, that there are lots of ways of thinking that establish truth criteria. But I would argue that they are multiple and that truths, therefore, are plural and each one relative to a framework within which it came into existence. But then when you say, well, which of the different theories, each with their truth, is the truth, I respond by saying, you're asking me how heavy Thursday is. That's a question that makes no sense for me. For me, my sense is the world is created, puts people in very different situations, and consequently, those people, you have your mother, I I have mine, you had your set of friends, I had mine, you read these books, I read those. End result, we're different. And we make sense of the world through the lenses of the experiences that have shaped all of us. And the world shaping us differently produces different interpretations of that world. And there we are. We are alive in a world that is shaping us. We react by understanding or trying to, developing an attitude, bumping into each other, sharing our different senses of how the world works, thereby changing each other. It's a little bit like making a friendship or having a romance or getting married. You discover pretty quickly that there are different ways you make sense of the world. And yeah, each of you can try to beat the other one into being like you. But if you're like most people, you discover that's a bad strategy for making a marriage or a friendship work. It's a little bit better to hear each other, see each other and begin to enjoy learning how people see the world differently. What can that tell you about your own way of thinking? I find, for example, that the science, so-called science of psychology, is an enormous step because it says, if you understand how a, a, a therapist deals with a patient, the issue isn't to get to the truth of what happened. You'll never do that. That person is the result of childhood experiences, half of which they don't even remember. And the, remember, the memories they have are full of all kinds of influences. But it doesn't matter because together the client and the therapist are going to build a theory, a story, a knowledge of that person's psychological nature. And that's therapeutic. It's therapeutic in the effort, in the construction, in the exploration. Getting to the final truth, it is discovered along the way. Freud did this too. You'll never know what the ultimate truth is, and it doesn't matter. You'll never know how heavy Thursday is. It doesn't matter. In terms of human self-consciousness and acceptance, here's the... The example that I find persuasive. No one watching or listening to this program is very worried about the fact that they cannot jump over the 
Empire State Building in Manhattan. No matter how long they train, no matter how hard they develop their muscles, getting ready, practicing, they're never going to do it. And you know what? People are laughing as I tell the story because they don't care. They know that they're not going to, and it doesn't bother them. They know that no one is ever going to do it, and that doesn't bother them. They just don't care. And I m imagine to myself a world in which we explore how and why we see the world differently as an endless adventure during life that enriches you and the people you interact with, that you get to the final truth. Who cares? It isn't there. And the fact that it isn't there hasn't really bothered you. And there is no reason now. And, and to say that is to say, look, you've lived in a world where there was one and you thought you needed it. I want you to understand there's another way of thinking about the world we live in where it doesn't exist and we don't need it. And there we are. So let me say something that might, first of all, I'm not 100% clear where you think we disagree, but maybe we can circle back to that. I'm happy to disagree if we do, but, but uh, let me give you something I've struggled with for a long time in terms of this issue of, let's say, belief in God versus belief that you know, what we see of and can discover of the material world is all there is versus, uh, you know, different ways of aesthetically, uh, you know, uh, experiencing the world and so on. As I, I often use, uh, not often, but I have used the metaphor of I, I'm in love, right? I'm, in, I'm wildly in love. And I tell you, the woman I love is the most beautiful woman on earth and I, I'm, I, I'm not, not just talking spiritually or so she is physically the most beautiful woman on earth and you say to me well it so happens that i have researched perceptions of human beauty in every culture in the world and conducted extensive statistics and based on a detailed study of the uh, you know the the structure of uh, of your wife's skull uh, i've learned that she so she ranks well don't get me wrong your girlfriend's go but uh, the proportions are only the 80th percentile here and the idiot is like wait a minute we're communicating on two different planes you're i'm communicating on an emotional one might say spiritual uh poetic plane and you are answering me in a quantitative analytical uh data-driven frame both of which are valid the problem arises when i say no that your science doesn't exist i don't believe it any study that doesn't conclude my girlfriend is the most beautiful woman on earth is flawed and you should be jailed for conducting it but but you also get into trouble you that my hypothetical scientist if you don't say for richard this woman is the most beautiful woman on earth and I accept it, and it's kind of beautiful to see. Does that make any sense to you? Yes, absolutely, but I would push back. Okay. I'm an economist. My profession has, over the period after World War II, become convinced that it can be and should be scientific. It should make all of its propositions uh, in mathematical form, testable with mathematical tests, statistical and otherwise. It, and it did that, in my judgment, because it wanted to get the reputation that already existed for the physicists, the mathematicians, the chemists, and the biologists. They were getting the money. They were getting the prestige after World War II with the development of uh, atomic bombs and all that. And they wanted to be a social science that got as much reputation and attention as the physical sciences. So they said, let's copy their system, their language, mathematics. So they actually believe that somehow they're in touch with the real world 
because of their observations and their measurements and their mathematical measures. It's childish. I can show you in 10 minutes every single statistic that you see nicely listed in some government document or in some think tank compendium has been made up by people who had to use all kinds of judgment about how to look at populations, how to count what they were doing, how to record what they were saying or thinking. It's full of people, here we go now, using their emotions and their biases, some conscious, many unconscious, separating out your emotional life from what you do is an imagination mm. of the scientist who wants you to believe that their view is somehow closer to that hard, real truth than yours is. It's a ploy. It's a device to win in a debate. But it's not a seriously defensible, for me, economic position. And I have that problem because in economics, you, you will not imagine the belief of the vast majority that we know what is going on. Let me do it yet one more way. Statistics, if you know, uh, one of the most popular ways to do statistics is called regression analysis. You do a set of procedures with two kinds of things you're dealing with. An unknown variable, something you want to explain, and then a bunch of things that are known. For example, why do interest rates go up these days? Right now, they're going up. Why? Well, we, do, we say we X, the question, why is it going up? The interest rate is related in some way to income levels, foreign exchange values, loan behavior of banks, and maybe two or three other things. Well, here comes the problem. Interest rates, like everything in the world, are influenced and affected by millions of things. People's decision to borrow money is affected by millions of things. Their family, their illness, their hopes, their dreams, their neighborhood, their job. I, mean, I could go on. You don't know which of those many variables to stick into your story because they're too many. You'd have to say the interest rate will go up depending on, and then you'd have a list of 500 or 5,000 or 5 million conditions. It can't handle that in mathematics, so we reduce it to three or four. And when we say to the scientist, how did you explain interest rates by looking at these three or four things? How did you know to use those three or four instead of the thousands of others you could have looked at? Oh, he said, that's well known. Bingo, there we are. Right. You, that's all you're doing. You, you never measured, which you can't do because there's millions of them, which is the most important. You're just asserting that. And the truth of it, you're asserting it because you, like me, went to the same graduate school, had the same professor with the same books teach us these are the variables you look at. And had we not done what that teacher said, we would have gotten a bad grade and not have the lucrative job we now do. It, we don't have 95% of economics professors in the United States thinking that capitalism is the best economic system since sliced bread because they are scientific. We have that view because they have been born and raised and rewarded in this society for believing that. And if you don't understand that, I think you're missing out on the reality as I see it that's all around us. Well, when uh, an economist, I, I think it was Greenspan, I, I, I'm not sure, but invoked animal spirits as uh, an explanation for market behavior. Look, there are beautiful indigenous belief systems that worship the spirits of animals, but that's that's theology. That's not science, right? <laughs> and, and and to me, that was an admission of uh, of theological, uh, you know, underpinnings, but.
And I also thought as you were speaking of the poet Robinson Jeffers, who was an environmentalist, uh, who wrote it in one of his poems, they would shit on the Morning Star if they could. In, in economics, the, the Morning Star is not assigned to value, I assume. So if there is, uh, if Elon Musk's satellites are launched in such a way, or someone else's satellites are launched in such a way that humanity will never see the Morning Star again, that will increase GDP, presumably. Therefore, it will be inherently good because the Morning Star is not considered in economics, which makes it, in mainstream economics, which makes it a kind of, to me, anti-human, anti-natural belief system, not a science. But I, I know I'm diverging from the point a little bit with that, but to me, if, if we're going to accept a multiplicity of human experiences, one of the most universal is appreciating the beauty of the morning star. And any science of humanity that is incapable of considering that in its equations to me is not a science at all it's it's something else it's a sort of almost pathological uh severing of one portion of the brain from the others i don't know i don't know if that's a good way to put it what do you think well i like where you're going with it and i think it does resolve whatever slight differences we may have I believe the animal spirits is a quotation initially from the single most important economist of the last century, at least in the West, and that's John Maynard Keynes. He came to a point as one of the great thinkers about how an economy moves over time, worked his way logically to saying it's crucially shaped by investment how much the capitalist class decides at any moment in time to take wealth and use it to produce more wealth. In other words, not consume it as food, clothing, shelter that I literally take into my body, but instead use it to produce more stuff, make it capital, make it wealth that is in the production process rather than the consumption process. So he focused us all on it investment. Then he tried to say, okay, if investment shapes everything, what shapes investment? Perfectly logical question. As he explored it, he came to the sad realization that there were millions of things. Right. And so he summarized them by saying, you know, the capitalist is in a weird position. He has to decide to invest now to produce something that won't come off the production line for months or years into the future. He can't possibly know whether the demand for what he's about to produce will be there then because he can't predict the future. So he has to guess. He has to take a chance. He has to risk an whether he could risk or should risk or how much he should risk, in what way he should, it's too much. So he summarized the complexity with the phrase, you know what governs investment? The animal spirits animating the investor class, which is a small part of the population. But it was his sideways recognition that he had reached the point where he could not establish, even though many have tried since, and they haven't advanced us one iota, to try to come up with the answer. It's this sad effort to come up with the truth that is, for me, at some fundamental place, the weird, the really weird behavior. Last point. You use the word value. What's a perfect example that word, value, we don't agree on that. And economists never had. From the beginning, Adam Smith used that word in a way different from David Ricardo, the two founders of modern economics. And they disagreed on what it meant with the third great economist of the early days of the discipline, Karl Marx. Marx, they all, by the way, called their the thing value. 
and all three of them had a labor theory of value. The famous phrase, the value of all things depends on the toil and trouble needed to produce them. That's not a quote from Karl Marx, for those of you that are not schooled in economics. That's a quote from Adam Smith. They all had labor theories of value, but they meant different things. Nowadays, my professors all use the word value in a way completely different from how Marx used it. I had to learn to deal with that, although my colleagues just ignored the Marxian because that's what the teachers did. I sat in the same classroom with the same professors reading the same books and articles at the same time as a young woman at Yale with me. Her name was Janet Yellen. She is currently the Secretary of the Treasury here in the United States. She never says a word about value in the Marxian sense. My guess is she hasn't a clue about that. She, For her, it exists in one theory, and for her, that one theory is the truth. I go around the country, and I'm not the only one, lecturing to economists and explaining to them that there's a, this theory of value and that theory of value and so on, and they yield different understandings, different policies to deal with problems. But it's like talking to children and teaching them that the, the only dessert in the world is not chocolate pudding. There are other things, which once they get it, it's quite exciting. But you feel sad for them that they've gone through most of their life thinking that chocolate pudding was the necessary end of every meal. Could be worse, by the way. But but in con so in conclusion, John Maynard Keynes, uh, in conjuring the phrase animal spirits, in a brilliant mind, and I think more humanistically oriented than yes. many generations of economists that came after him, looked at the nature of investment and investors. And finally, when he looked into it enough, he saw the same ineffable, intangible, uh, mysterious quality in their eyes that, that one sees in the eye that looks at the morning star. Is that a fair conclusion? Yes. And that, and I love that you brought up the word mystery, because to understand the concept of mystery is to get at least closer to understanding our understanding is always and necessarily partial. That's why the things believed to be true a thousand years ago are laughed at now. That's why the things true 20 years ago in many areas are rejected now. The truths people swore by meant that they had forgotten the mystery that is everywhere. One of the greatest painters of the 20th century, the Belgian surrealist René Magritte, in every painting he produced, foregrounded mystery. You saw a, peer, uh, a fireplace out of which came a locomotive. You saw a bird wearing a top hat. If you understood, and he explained it, he wanted to bring the mystery back in. We need to see not only what's there, but the mystery of what's there. That keeps the world open. That keeps us open to change and forecloses the dogmatic assertion that this is the truth, which hounds us everywhere in our modern world and ought alone to be a reason to doubt absolute truths and go in the direction of welcoming the multiplicity of relative truths. Well, trust me, I'm there on that. And I'm still not 100% sure where we disagree. Maybe we'll have to reconvene at some point and, and, and go into detail on our disagreements. But uh, I love this discussion. Thank you so much, Richard Wolf, uh, as always, for coming on the program. I look forward to next time.
Me too. And I'm glad we talked about this. These kinds of conversation are too often dismissed as having to be academic and distant and vague and out of the picture, but they're actually fundamental. And you don't have to use obscure words to have these conversations. That's That's- so, all right, we'll be right back after this. I'm Richard R.J. Escow, and this is The Zero Hour. <laughs> 